And Cynthia, you can go first if you want. Editorial oh, page editor. Oh, all right, uh, welcome back everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us for another editorial board uh, Zoom uh, meeting. Today we are continuing our discussion about education. Uh, last week we were focusing on K through 12. This week we're focusing on higher education. We're really lucky to have two outstanding guests today. Uh, Dr. Taylor Amy, president of University of Texas San Antonio. Dr. Cynthia Matson, uh, president of Texas A&M University uh, San Antonio as well. So thanks to both of you for joining us. I'm just gonna briefly Go around the Zoom room, make sure everyone knows who's on this call. We have our publisher, Mark Medici, uh, education reporter, Krista Tarova, uh, Carrie Clack, who's an editorial writer and columnist, and Gloria Padilla, who's also an editorial writer and columnist. Uh, so I'll just kick things off with a question to each of you. As we move into the fall semester, both institutions are um, you know, approaching the return to school in slightly different ways. And I was just hoping that you could outline to parents, educators, teachers, you know, what the fall semester is going to look like at your respective institutions. So, uh, Dr. Amy, we'll start with you at UTSA. You've, you've said 95% uh, digital for the fall semester, and then we'll turn our attention to a and San Antonio. Yeah, um, if I had to pick a, a, a word that describes what began back in March or even January and continues through to today and beyond, it's the concept of flexibility and adaptability the things we thought we would be thinking about for the fall two months ago are obviously different now. And the course of the pandemic in our, our city and state and country and globally is obviously very, very evolving. And so uh, the only thing that we can promise is flexibility and adaptability. And all that we've done since this spring about our, our response to the pandemic has been grounded in these two principles. One, the success, of each and every one of our students is paramount, but we need to do this in a way that also is essential and important, and that's to protect the health and well-being of our community, our, both our UTSA community and San Antonio. So much of what we've been doing has been based in that sort of construct. And uh, um, as we pivoted from going completely online this spring to online this summer to a sort of a hybrid model for the fall, we've learned a lot along the way. And, and I'm really grateful to our faculty and how they've pivoted dramatically over, over time. Uh, I, I, hopefully I'll have a chance to share a little bit about the work they've been doing to prepare for the fall semester, especially. Um, right now, our enrollment is looking uh, just the same as it was last year at this time. So we're not seeing a diminution in, in enrollment. Uh, so that's a very promising thing. I think our our students want to continue their trajectories. They don't want this pandemic to impact them in any way more than it already has. Um, I would I would offer this as a as an observation. Our our modalities for the fall are going to be um, uh, uh, slightly different than than what we did this spring and summer. Our total total course offerings are about 4,200 courses uh, for the fall. And um, if you look at all of the organized courses that are basically face-to-face um, uh, -face courses, that really represents about 200 courses uh, going into the fall. And that's about 6% of our, our organized course modality. So uh, we're really looking right now at, at offering about 200 of these classroom style face-to-face -face classes. Uh, and we're gonna be putting them in about 18 different buildings and we're working with the registrar to spread them out over the, 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 the daily schedule so that we're de-densifying uh, the number of folks that are going to be on campus taking face-to-face -face classes. But most of our modality is going to be online asynchronous, online hybrid, and online synchronous. Um, nonetheless, um, with the, the students that are going to be in our dormitories, with student athletes that are back, with our faculty and graduate students that are back, uh, doing research and then with our face-to-face -face modality, we're probably on any one day of the week, we'll still have 2,000 individuals on campus. Now you have to remember our, our, our institution is, is made up of almost 33,000 students and another 4,500 employees. So we're a pretty big operation, but uh, campus will not look like a traditional 
fall campus opening, it will not be packed with people. There will be obviously kids on campus taking classes. There'll be faculty offering face-to-face -face, um, instruction. There will be uh, facilities workers and dining hall workers and uh, um, uh, the like on campus, but most of our modality is going to be online. Dr. Matson, uh, it's going to be uh, slightly different for Texas A&M University of San Antonio, right? Um, you're hoping to have 30% of classes. In yeah, let me explain a little bit about that. So first of all, you know, I think one good analogy that I've heard recently is that we're all in the same storm. We're just in different boats. And so let me explain a little bit about what the boat looks like over at Texas A&M San Antonio. We have a very similar philosophy to UTSA as Taylor was describing about flexibility and adaptability. But I think for us too, the other component is we really embrace uh, the A&M system guidance that we have been receiving, but also the importance of recognizing that we're a community of learners. And what does that look like in terms of self-responsibility for the students who choose to come here? We are doing everything that we can voluntarily. Uh, we have 100% options for students to be online, virtually remote, as well as what we have for those students who will be coming for face-to-face -face instruction. Uh, the, when we talk about numbers, uh, we really uh, study the community of learners that we serve, and we know we are primarily first generation, primarily historically underrepresented minorities, and in many cases, those that are in households of distress. So we recognize the need for some students that would be better served in a face-to-face -face environment. And we tried to build something around that that would support that community of learners. So we built a block schedule for freshmen with a maximum enrollment of 18 in a class. That's proper social distancing and what would normally be a 30 or 36 um, seat opportunity. And we built courses uh, as simple as you know, one to four courses, depending on what credit load a student comes in with, so they could take them in a block. And the intent was that the instructors would change, the faculty members would change, but the students would stay in the same room. Thus, there is mitigating the opportunity for them to congregate and to be in hallways at the same time. As Taylor was describing um, the sort of the heat map environment of we have, we're using six buildings for our classroom spaces. We have 173 course offerings. And with our diminished capacity, the most people we would have on campus in instructional purposes now is about 389. Now that is a full face-to-face -face instruction. So that's about 13% of our course offerings. Taylor said he, he has about over 4,000 courses. We have close to 1,300 courses that are being offered. So that 13%, then the delta to get to the 30% are the hybrid courses. So we have courses in which are primarily being taught remotely, but there may be a reason that a faculty member would bring that class together either here or some other location once a month, uh, once a week, uh, twice a month. And those are hybrid courses. They follow the appropriate definition of those. So when you combine those two together, that's how we get to the close to 30% of, of individuals that would be in place at one time. We do have a residence hall. Uh, we were expecting about 300 students in our residence hall. Normally we would have about 400 students. Uh, fortunately, we're opening up a brand new building um, in a couple of weeks actually. That's a classroom hall that provides even more square footage, um, which kind of gets back to the numbers I was giving you earlier about around 600,000 gross square feet of instructional space that we're using for the 173 courses that we're offering. Um, so there are a number of opportunities for flexibility with the faculty. We're providing a PPE for everyone but with the face mask. They also have the option of a face shield if they so desire. And uh, we have these uh, created these rolling plexiglass. Uh, so depending on what the faculty member is going to do in their classroom, they can move this plexiglass around in front of them if they would like. Uh, so that provides another layer of precaution. The other piece that I was mentioning earlier about 
uh, self-responsibility. We are creating uh, wellness stations, trying to look at this very proactively, very affirmatively. We believe that for a student to be able to come to campus is a privilege and to have face-to-face -face instruction if they so desire is also a privilege. So we're asking everyone to comply with that privilege. And we're providing a, a mandatory uh, training, a daily self-certification. So students will check in at the wellness stations, have their uh, temperature screen, do the self-certification, answer any questions that they might have. Then when they get to the building that they're going to have their instruction, there'll be another public health safety assistant that will greet them and make sure that they that they um, have gone through the wellness station. If not, then they will do that right there, signify it, and then they'll be allowed into the building for their instruction. So we have one ingress and egress point in the six buildings that we're using for the most part. And again, it's to help people socialize to the expectation of in-person instruction. And like Taylor said, we'll have a contract support for custodial, for facilities, for cafeteria support, uh, those, those individuals that are providing other needed services that it takes to run an academic campus. And I think I'll pause there. So Dr. Matson, are your classes um, Monday through Friday? You went into the weekends, uh, into the evenings, spread out students? Yes, Gloria, yes. Uh, our classes are Monday through Friday, including evening courses. We'll have some Saturday courses as well. So we're using, the only day we don't have an officially scheduled course is Sunday. Do you have very many um, lab courses? Yes, we do have lab courses. Um, I can give you the exact number. Uh, it, some of them are in the hybrid bucket and some of them are, are in the face-to-face -face bucket. So I don't have them aggregated by lab, lab courses, but I can get that number to you. No, I was just concerned because there were a lot of students who were worried um, when everything went online back in the spring that they had lab courses and those were vital to their um, education in that particular course. So. Well, you're absolutely right. And, and as Taylor alluded to, th there's a lot of things we learned from when we shut down in March to where we are today. And we've been able to provide that those courses that are best supported in person. Lab courses are a great example, along with other specialty courses that best benefit from intergroup interaction are, are going to be held face to face with proper social distancing and, and students will flip. So not everyone will be there at the same time. We've uh, enhanced all of our facilities with more cameras, more microphones. So for those faculty members, for example, in a lab, maybe there'll be eight students in the lab, but there'll be the other eight uh, watching online on a Monday. And then on a Wednesday, it'll be reversed. Those students that were watching online would be in person. So we have an opportunity for everyone to have that in-person interaction in a lab course, for example. Um, I'm just, just one more question. Oh, sorry. Um, no, so what, what, what do you think this online learning is going to do to your graduation rates? What about students who need internships or who, do, who need student teaching um, experience to um, finish up their degrees? Both of you on that one. Well, I'll go first. On, in terms of the teaching experiences, we're still moving forward with all of the districts in which we have partnerships and we have an agreement with the, with really every school district in San Antonio, but we're really focused on South Bear County as part of the Aspire agreement. And, and so our students are still going to go forward with the appropriate protocols with whatever the schools require to participate in that. And then in terms of internships or externships, we will have uh, guidelines that are coming out for the May Center for Experiential Learning and Community Engagement, as well as the faculty standards for some of their internships to ensure proper safety for students. Taylor mentioned it, and I, and I will say again, you know, safety is our highest priority. It's almost ubiquitous in everything that we're doing. And so we're building all of our experiences around a safety a protocol and safety modules. I would, uh, Gloria, I would say we're, we're doing essentially the same sorts of things. Actually, um, it's worth uh, discerning this, these data a little bit. Um, when we, we think about our organized courses, we tend to think about classroom experience with, with other students in, a, in, a, in an enclosed environment with a, someone lecturing at the front of the room. Uh, we're actually, of, of our 46, of our 4,200 courses, a lot are face-to-face, -face, but they're individualized because they involve independent study between a faculty member and a student and on a one-to-one -one basis, uh, an internship, either externship, internship opportunity involving instruction from a faculty member, a dissertation instruction involving a student and a faculty member, a thesis, single student, faculty member. 
self-paced supervision. So, so a lot of our, 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 especially our practicum courses are, are involving um, uh, individualized face-to-face uh, -face opportunities, which are, are pretty different than having to manage a classroom with social distancing and, and, and the like. Um, with regards to our, our especially our, our College of Education and Human Development and the, their focus on, on preparing teachers and getting teachers into to, uh, real, real teaching opportunities, our college is working with the ISDs to, to ensure that we can get our, 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 our students out, out doing that. So that, that's being worked out um, on, a, on an individual basis by each of our, 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 our student interns uh, working with an ISD. So. Just to um, piggyback on Gloria's question a little bit, um, you know, when, when we think about internship opportunities or you know, kind of workforce training opportunities that college students usually have and, and may or may not be available despite best efforts at this time, do you all, are you all having discussions about extending those opportunities to graduates uh, after they graduate, you know, so that, you know, students that are in this kind of two, three, four year window maybe that there are ways the university can assist with professional development in a non-traditional timeline, you know, so that those opportunities are still there for students who expected those. I can uh, dive in on that one a little bit. Um, we we uh, just went through our accreditation process with our accrediting body, um, SAC, COC, and uh, we just uh, had our, our exit interview with the, with the virtual visiting team uh, this morning and our quality enhancement uh, plan, which we've been working really hard on over the last uh, two years to develop uh, is related to this whole idea of classroom to career. And um, it's, it's called uh, career fuel. And it has to do with uh, the opportunity for internships, externships, and uh, undergraduate research, and uh, uh, it's a, it's a pretty bold plan, and we're 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 going to be launching that this fall, and it, it's going to involve our, our obviously working with our career center and all of our our partners in the community about placement of students under under these opportunities, um, and uh, so we're we're going to proceed with it. In some cases, it's going to still have to be virtual. We have a lot of students who have been doing uh, externships, um, internships this summer virtually, and uh, I, I think that's going to continue. They're still getting great value out of it, but as the pandemic progresses and as the situation warrants and as appropriate, we obviously want our students to be in the community working at a not-for-profit, working for state or city government or the federal government working with the private sector, we, we want these kinds of experiences uh, uh, to happen as much as possible. And it's gonna be dependent on, on the course of the pandemic. So I would say, Josh, uh, I think you're aware of the Mays Family Foundation contribution to A&M San Antonio that helped create the Mays Center for Experiential Learning and Community Engagement. It's been in place now for four years. Uh, this has really been a capstone. We provide an experiential learning transcript. So to, directly to your question about the experiences that have been disrupted, uh, we'll, we have found that most employers did go virtual. We had actually very few that uh, completely dropped out. And through the May Center, we were able to help provide some guidance for how to do that virtually. On our own campus, for example, we maintained all of our student employees. Uh, that was over 300 student employees when we shut down in spring that worked remotely and virtually. And the May Center helped us, uh, established uh, training tools, uh, supervisory tools for uh, measuring performance how to think about reassignments for student, student employees who would have normally been working on campus, et cetera. So that's been a, a critical part of our overall strategy. In the College of Business, we have one credit experiential learning courses. And so it's not all specifically related to the internship opportunities. And we are finding uh, ways to engage our employers and our nonprofits because through the May Center, we're able to offer stipends to those unpaid internships. And that is of high value now also. And so we're finding that benefit of being able to work with the nonprofits and how we think about that. Now, some students take experiential learning or internships for coursework, uh, either at the undergraduate or the graduate level. And the faculty have been very flexible 
in altering that curriculum as needed so that students are still getting that experience. The other thing you asked about was alumni. And uh, we have found through the May Center that we're retooling and reaching out to alumni with specialty workshops for reskilling, how they think about virtual interviews, how they think about presenting themselves virtually, um, communication, presence, uh, confidence, and then how to document these types of experiences. So our May Center team has been on top of this um, from day one and looking ahead and trying to peek around the corner. None of us like the pandemic going on as long as it has been, but we know we have to modify our expectations and meet the needs of students that are getting ready to graduate as well as uh, those that have already graduated. And I think Josh, to your point, you know, we talk a lot at AM San Antonio about affluence and networks because we know that these are opportunities our students often don't have. And that is what has helped drive the May Center for Experiential Learning and that experiential learning transcript. So we've been trying to think ahead about how to ensure that network and affluence isn't diminished so that the equity lens falls even further behind in the students that we're serving. So I appreciate your question because I think that's a really uh, driving force in how we are having to manage and think differently about how we give students excellent opportunities so that the equity bridge doesn't widen but rather narrow so where we can. And here at AM, and I know um, UTSA has done this as well, we've tried to bridge that digital divide. It wasn't what you asked about, but I think it's worth mentioning for us in particular where we're located geographically right in the heart of the digital divide to create that digital bridge with all the technical tools that we can provide and the training and digital literacy and fluency that we can help students with to maintain and build up their currency. So is it too early to know what your um, return rate is gonna be on the kids, on the students that were on campus in the, in the spring? How many are actually re-enrolling? Or you said you're, Dr. Taylor, or I mean, you said you, that the rate was about the same. Are these same students returning or you are attracting new students? Well, th these are numbers that change on a, on a daily basis. So- Hourly. Um, and, and there's still much to happen between now and obviously the first day of school, which is August 24th, and then the the, 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 the drop date uh, 10 days after opening of school. But um, right now, it, it looks like um, we're, we're doing well with respect to persistence uh, into year two and year three and year four. That's all looking good. Our, we're spending a lot of time with, with uh, our incoming freshmen and our transfers, the transfer rate, it looks like it's gonna be the same as last year. We're, we're spending time mostly on shoring up our, our new freshmen coming in. And uh, I would share this too. Um, uh, when we, we finished the spring semester, we reached out to, uh, we did a large survey for all of our current students and asked them about the experience they went through about learning online and what, what, what they liked, what, what we needed to improve how we might deliver course content differently and the like. And there was a general high degree of satisfaction from our current students in the spring semester about how we pivoted. I, we ended up um, uh, in the course of two weeks, you may recall that we extended spring break for a week and kept school closed for that second week so that we could pivot and put 4,600 courses online and prepare the faculty for that. And during that two week period, we had 1,200 faculty go through a boot camp to, to prep for that, and and uh, we've been doing that this summer and this fall, and uh, we're offering almost 800 new classes uh, online this fall that have been developed over the summer for new offerings uh, out of the 4,200 that we're going to be offering. And uh, I would say this: the, the the sense that we got from the current students was that we were doing a good job with online delivery, and they appreciated the efforts and. And then we, we actually queried uh, incoming freshmen and their families about their willingness to go online. And there was a high degree of acceptance of that. I think everybody wants to get on with the uh, continuing their academic trajectories. No one wants to have a, a, a necessarily a gap year. Um, but, but right now I would say all of our efforts around continuing persistence from year one into two, into three, into four are, paying off and we're not seeing any melt in that regards. And the one place that we 
are continuing to pay close attention is our incoming freshmen. And that's, again, looking like a new number. So right now, things are looking promising with respect to the traditional student success measures you care about, about persistence. How about your, your students from the hard hit Rio Grande Valley? Um, they're, they're having a really difficult time with COVID. Um, how are the numbers looking from there? You know, actually, I, what I'd like to do is get back to you about that. I don't have a, a sense of uh, that level of granularity about um, either new students or returning students. Uh, um, the, the, I would say most of our, I'd say these are going to be approximations. 40% of our students are from Bear County, and then the, the majority are from Houston and the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and then the Valley. So I, I, don't, I don't think that, I'd say maybe out of our 32,000 students, probably 2,500 are coming from, from the Valley, and I, I don't have a, 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 a breakdown of a new, you know, freshmen coming from the Valley or, or persistence around students returning uh, who are from the Valley. But let me see if I can and, uh, locate that data and get back to you about it. Thank you. So Gloria, for us, uh, our numbers are, are looking about the same as they did last year, uh, constant. You know, we had a big surge in the summer, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, what we have seen is our continuing students are persisting. And not only that, are they, they're taking more courses. Uh, I have talked to many working adults who might have taken classes part-time and worked full-time. Almost all of our students, even the traditional freshmen, work full-time. It's a statistic I'm not proud of, um, but, but they do so for all kinds of family means and family income areas. Again, think about where we're located. We're finding, what I, when I talk to students, and a lot of them reach out to me um, through social media and other means, so I actually have a pretty regular connection with students besides our student employees. Um, what I am finding is that uh, they are happy for the schedules that, that most more classes are online. And so they're able to take more course credits and they can see their trajectory moving faster. So especially parents with children while they're juggling all kinds of things in their life, they're happy that they have more courses. Um, we have seen some of our students from Rio Grande Valley and from Houston who are choosing to either sit out for financial reasons or they're not gonna come, they're gonna stay enrolled uh, remotely but not come to campus and live in housing. Uh, so we've seen both scenarios. And I think for freshmen, what we're seeing more is we have quite a few students still on the fence. Um, I think this normally in a normal session between the last week in July, our classes start August 20th, you, you'll find this big flood of any numbers. I mean, anywhere from 500 to 1,000 students, it's probably bigger at Taylor's place, that are just Waiting. deciding what they're going to do that last three or four weeks before the semester starts. And what we don't know at AM, and I, I suspect this is true for UT, we don't know if those behavior patterns are going to change. Uh, the consumer behavior of a student right now is very unpredictable. And so we're doing a lot more outreach, a lot more one-on-one -on -one connection. And uh, we, we've reopened our welcome center. It was never closed. We, we've, um, we're welcoming them on campus. And this whole week, there has been a steady stream with proper social distancing and face masks of people coming in. What we often find, Gloria, and I think you'll appreciate this, even when we communicate with students electronically or they talk with a financial aid a professional that their aid is here and it's ready, they still want to come in and see you and make sure and have that connection that is it really here? Are my bills really going to be? paid. So we've seen those students coming in to confirm their financial aid, where we can offer more financial support, emergency aid through grants and other where we're trying to meet every need. So we know and recognize that particularly with first generation students, they need that one on one contact. And we're doing everything we can to build that bridge, Gloria, but it is it's tough. And we see students in distress. I can tell you, um, I myself have had messages from students whom I physically have been able to talk to on the phone who have been homeless through this, um, through the uh, COVID period uh, when everything was shut down. It's just heartbreaking stories. And I appreciate that I, when I can talk with them and put them in connection with the right services and help them to get there. So it just reminds me how important that one-on-one -on -one connection is. And we just can't do that for everybody. It's, it's, it's The scale is too big. And so, Taylor and myself and Mike, I mean, we talk about how to make these connections with students, especially in the public. That's our role as public universities and public colleges uh, to be accessible and readily available and to help students meet a variety of needs that are before them. It's you know, tough well, for you. 
one of the one thing that's a good indicator of the stress in the system is the response uh, that we've had from our students around the CARES Act funding that we've been giving out. So we had three tranches of funds come in, about 15 million that were intended to go directly to students for emergency financial aid and support, and another 15 million that could have gone entirely to the institution to, uh, you know, to cover costs related to COVID. And we've elected to give out about 10 million of that 15 million in scholarships and tech technology grants to address the digital divide concerns that are out there. And then the, we have an access to us. Um, I, I think Cynthia does also as well. Um, uh, because we're a Hispanic serving institution, we have access to an, another 2 million that also is being distributed like the first 15 million. And the last time I checked, out of the first tranche, I think we've given out 10 or 11 million and um, our technology grants and scholarships are, are, are also being uh, distributed as we speak. And uh, uh, the demand for these things has been really high. And um, like, like Cynthia, 75% of our undergraduates work outside of the institution to help put themselves through school. And uh, some, I mean, typically are working 20 hours a week and, and some 30, some 40 hours a week and, and uh, they've been losing their sometimes their first job or their second job and and the financial stress that's out there is is real. Um, we continue our, our, our bold promise initiative and have putting a, as many resources into that as possible to basically provide the opportunity to attend UTSA if your family has an income level below about 50,000. So so that has become a very popular thing to, to invoke and put out there and it's a very needed and necessary thing. And uh, I can tell you that um, Cynthia, Mike and I all worry about persistence, especially after the first year of attendance. And uh, if you don't get that right, you you end up with a very real possibility of losing that student to their academic path and trajectory. And so we're all putting our, our principal efforts into retention and persistence. And typically it's financial aid that has a big, big, big impact on that. So in these very constrained times economically, we're all using the federal dollars and our own dollars and encouraging applications for, for, for state and, and federal financial aid all to help our students uh, come through year one and get into year two and year three and year four. And uh, uh, these are all really important efforts. So at AM San Antonio, we had about $5.6 million in CARES Act funding. We did have the, it's a, it's a different proportional level than what UT has. And then we, the AM system announced a $100 million Regents scholarship uh, just over the summer. So we have distributed about uh, 1,300 different awards uh, to our students with CARES Act funding to help support them. Um, we were not necessarily doing digital uh, tech grants like Taylor described. We just provided uh, loaner laptops and MiFi's or hotspots to any student who needed them uh, back in March. We continue that through the summer and we're doing it again at the fall, not through tech grants, but just direct awards. For summer, we provided book scholarships for all students who were attending A&M San Antonio for summer. And we mailed out the books to the best as we could. We didn't always have current addresses so that students didn't have to come in and pick up course materials. Uh, so the same philosophy, we know how important the aid is for students and we wish we had more aid to distribute. Um, we've had a, a great surge in emergency grants um, through our emergency aid program, which is separate from the CARES Act program. We've had some fundraising going on to help us support more of those students. And then our food pantry also saw a significant more increase for support um, over the summer months, uh, more end of March and into the summer months. And I'm just curious if uh, both of you could speak to the, the question of faculty safety. I mean, obviously most of the coursework will be online, but uh, we you, obviously both institutions will still have some courses where it uh, is in person. And uh, I don't know uh, how comfortable faculty necessarily are with being in classrooms and, um, you know, what if a faculty member doesn't want to be there and is slated for something that really mandates in-person teaching. So. Uh, we'll start with you, Dr. Matson, and um, and then jump over to Dr. Amy. And of course, when I speak fa safe faculty, I'm also referring to adjuncts. 
Yes, so our course sections, um, we have an equal number, 33 tenure track faculty members, 33 full-time lecturers and professional track faculty members, so 66 of our full-time permanent that are teaching these 173 courses. We have 27 adjuncts and 16 staff, and that's primarily the freshman year experience. And so all of those individuals have complete volunteer assignments. No one was directed. Uh, faculty chose their modalities. Uh, we even have um, some of those smaller interaction group courses that faculty members decided that they wanted to do that. I do think there is some nervousness about uh, coming to campus and uh, what that will entail. For us, we are providing uh, PPE, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the face mask, the sanitation, the, the face shields, and the rolling plexiglass. But thanks to the department chairs, um, they're the ones on the front line doing the course scheduling. Uh, it has been quite the feat this year, uh, you know, sort of the sausage making that occurs in building an, a roster for fall term is largely electronic. Uh, and so when you're making all these changes course by course, hybrid, high flex, face to face, it's actually very manual. So loading up 1300 course sections is it, by the registrar's office is, is a fair amount of work. And then also in, the la in any given semester, this is true for UT or any campus I've ever worked, in the last month, you find a lot of changes, course adds, drops, uh, faculty members change for all kinds of reasons, adjuncts, lectures, et cetera. So there's a lot of normal movement that would occur in the, in the academic calendar and the academic scheduling these last few weeks. Did I address what you were looking for, Josh? Yeah, that I mean, that in a in a kind of a ten thousand foot perspective, yeah, I, you know, it's just saying that I've wondered is how comfortable teachers is the oh. faculty might be with being in yeah. that classroom setting. You're saying it's voluntary, so I assume the comfort level is somewhat high. Um, but you know, I, I think as the surge has risen, I, I mean, I, there's no doubt. All of us, everybody on this call, I think you're nervous about where you go, or you're thoughtful about where you go. Maybe nervous is not the right word, but thoughtful, conscientious. Um, trying to be as safe as you can be. So I think we're doing everything we can to, even though they are faculty volunteers who have said, I want to do this, would I say, if you ask them individually, that they would say they have zero nervousness? I don't, I don't think anybody has zero nervousness about anything. So we're trying to mitigate to the extent we can, and we're very appreciative of those faculty who have chosen to volunteer for teaching in, purpose, in person, excuse me. So um, this is an important uh, question. Well, actually every question here is important, but this one's important. Um, our, our, our approach from the beginning is that if you're a student and you want to do everything remotely, you can. Mm -hmm. If you're a faculty member and you wanna do everything remotely, you can. What we've done, and because we're offering 4,200 courses to 33,000 students and we have about 1,400 faculty who are doing all of this wonderful work to, 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 to allow our students to, to learn in the best possible way. Uh, what we had to really do at, at scale uh, at UTSA was generally announce our uh, approach to opening this fall as we've described, but then the whole process of, of working with each college and each department about how each course section is going to be offered is as Cynthia described, a very manual laborious process to get that all loaded into the system and then put out on an app that your student, because we have ASAP and that's how we inform our students about their course assignments and course modalities. And so we had to go through that whole process from uh, uh, early, early, well, early June to, to sort of like, well, late June to, to early July, late July to, to put that all out there. and. Uh, um, so once that all went out there, um, uh, it, 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 it locked into place at that moment how we were going to offer each course uh, by modality. But, but integral to all of it was the, the deans and the department chairs working with each of their faculty about their comfort level about offering courses. So, so if you're a, an individual that has risk factors, you're not having to teach online. If you have individuals at home that are have risk factors, you can work out with your dean uh, a way to, to not have to take classes or, or offer classes in person. So, so this was all worked out in a very elaborate and lengthy process given the size and scale of the institution. But um, I would also put it out this way too. Um, 
part of the, the reason why I think our, our community and our campus has bought into this is we've used a series of task force that have been deeply representative of faculty, staff, students around public health, around opening research uh, activities, around preparing campus for the fall, around preparing our academic enterprise for the fall. And a lot of the, the grounding of all of this has been our public health task force, which was uh, populated by wonderful experts, uh, faculty, staff, and students, and outside advisors. And they really have charted a course for the entire institution around masking, around disinfection, around social distancing, and room occupancy, and <clears throat> how to operate a dormitory. And, and uh, one of the things that we're doing is we're requiring everybody to go through compliance training about the pandemic and, and public health and public safety. and masking and distancing and, and what to do if you show symptoms. We're using an app to uh, give everybody a chance to examine their, their, their symptoms situation every day and whether they've come into contact with people that are symptomatic or known to have COVID. Um, we are working uh, very hard still, it's not finished yet, about um, identifying opportunities so that we can have a preferred testing opportunity and a preferred uh, um, uh, fast turnaround opportunity for testing for our dormitory situation in the event that we have a, a, you know, symptomatic individuals in our dorms. So we were working on the testing component right now. But part and parcel to all of this, and I think Cynthia has said the same thing, we've adopted, we're an educational institution and this is a teachable moment and we've adopted this strategy that this pandemic and how we come together as a community is a teachable moment and we're calling it do your part. And what we're really asking is everybody in our community to be smart about this, to support each other about it, to go through the compliance training, to wear masks. Uh, we have a whole strategy in place uh, around what happens if an individual elects not to wear a mask on campus. Um, uh, that, that, uh, we, we have a whole process in place about how we we, we, uh, we work with individuals that are symptomatic and how we contact trace and how we quarantine. So a lot of this is just really, really hard work in the weeds, getting it all organized. And it's still work in progress between now and when we open on August 24th, principally around having our testing opportunities finalized. That's almost, almost complete. But um, the principle of all this, I go back to what I said in the beginning, is student success is paramount and this health and safety of our community is paramount. And as a big institution, we're doing our very best to, to make sure that both of those uh, sort of founding principles are adhered to. You know, Josh, in response to a couple of things that Taylor said, I, I'd, I'd offer a couple of other thoughts. Um, at a and I think, think something that's just a little bit different, or maybe it's not, I didn't hear Taylor mention this, but within the AM system, we have had a pretty clear, clear guidance from an AM system perspective with protocols um, and how, how we were to move forward. Here at AM San Antonio, we did have a, a group called Blueprint 2020 that was four subcommittees that was formed in May, end of April, beginning of May, and worked through the summer and have informed our decisions within the AM system guidelines. As an AM system, uh, and uh, we have AM Health Science Center and Texas Division of Emergency Management, known as TEDM, as part of our team, um, there are many uh, group acquisitions. For example, uh, the group acquisition of sanitation supplies. Uh, throughout the system, we have one facilities contractor called SSC. Um, so all of our facilities operations and maintenance guidelines have been established system-wide. Um, through the AM system, we have received uh, tests. Um, so the, the tests would remember when they were in short demand, we have a block through a, a third party vendor. We have an allotment that's been assigned to a and San Antonio. And we have, um, through the A&M system, a public health experts that are assigned directly to us. Obviously, we work with Metro Health and other uh, local uh, Bear County professionals, but we have that through the system. And then we have regular checkpoints with a and System Health Science Center, as well as the Texas Division of Emergency Management. 
at the president's level and the provost level and the VP level so that we're able to leverage our size and the unique assets that we have and how we think about operating. So some things have been a little bit more prescriptive than others, but we can operate within that prescription with our flexibility. So we're really able to leverage the best of both. And then when I talk to my colleagues like Taylor and Mike, as we've been talking about, there are things that I learned from them. There are things that we share with each other that we're all looking towards because there is no one right answer and there is no silver bullet. And, and Taylor just said it and I wanna reiterate that our plan is online too and we're working every day on some things that are gonna change, the, the prescriptions around the testing as you were talking about, the contact tracing, the um, what we're going to do when scenario X and scenario Y and making sure we can give as much pre-information as we can so that we're not caught thinking about something that we hadn't already thought about beforehand. And that's where the benefit of not only being part of a system, but being part of a community here in San Antonio with other public universities and colleges where we have the benefit of learning and sharing with each other. So I think it's been a very collaborative approach within San Antonio and Bear County, but I feel very beneficial for us to be part of the AM system and how we're thinking about this in terms of national norming and national modeling. Truth is, um, Cynthia and I both were uh, received very beneficial input about how to open from the Texas Higher Ed Coordinating Board because the mm -hmm. governor has tasked the, the coordinating board with uh, advising and counseling all of the public uh, four-year institutions on, on how best to open. And so we've been using that guidance and Cynthia has been using that guidance. And uh, you'd all be happy to know that in addition to Mike and Cynthia and I always being on Zooms together, all of the, the president's public and private here in San Antonio, we get together every two weeks okay. to talk about strategies. So whether it's Incarnate Word or Trinity or Our Lady of the Lake or St. Mary's, we're all, we're all, um, all chatting about how to do sure. this well. Or in some, in some ways, there's no perfect decision and there's certainly no best decision. It's sometimes these things feel like they're the, how to make the best out of maybe worst decisions. And, mm -hmm. and uh, um, it's, it's actually the, the opportunity to, to coordinate and to, to, to talk about things is really welcome. Uh, so we, we benefited from that. And then I would also share, I'm a little bit lucky in this regards because my sister institution, UT Health San Antonio is just right next door and they're helping us with the testing protocols and procedures with our student athletes. And they're gonna be available for our testing uh, program that we're gonna put in place around how we're managing our, our dorms. and. Uh, um, uh, so that so that's a, a, a very special thing for us as well. Um, so we do benefit both of us from the systemness that we're both in. So uh, there is a, a sense in the University of Texas system that for the eight academic institutions to try and align to the best extent possible, knowing that all things are local. So we we do that, um, uh, and uh, it's it's we have benefits uh, from being in our system. But I. I, I'm very glad that that Cynthia has the opportunities that are afforded her by by the AM system there, uh, the, especially around the, the testing opportunities that were offered when testing was not really as available as it is now. So so that was a good thing. So you know, Taylor, Taylor mentioned athletics. Excuse me, Mark. Just let me make this comment. Um, Josh, I think you're aware of this, or uh, we did make a decision to suspend. We were supposed to start our athletic programs. Um, this fall, not football, Taylor, um, but uh, men and women's soccer. And we, although we've been accepted in the NAIA and the Red River Conference will be in the same uh, league as uh, Lady of the Lake, uh, we chose not to start athletics this fall, all things considered way back in, in well, it seems way back. May it was just a few months ago, but these days feel like weeks sometimes, right? Uh, so we made the choice to postpone and we'll start in the spring, provided spring sports start with uh, women's softball and men's golf. I, I definitely want to ask a question about athletics, but um, prior to that, I think this, I think the, first of all, congratulations to both of you. I, I really appreciate the transparency. It's been uh, really wonderful to listen to all of the uh, steps that each each of your universities have taken. It's it's pretty it's really impressive. Um, back to on on campus resident living. Um, COVID has obviously proven to move very very quickly um, when transmission happens. 
Can you talk more specifically about how you'll manage a quarantine process if you do have an outbreak in one of your dorms? Like, have you set aside um, uh, uh, other dorms that are that are specifically for quarantine students? And how will you manage kind of quarantining a, a 19 year old into their dorm room for 14 days? I'd, I'd love to just hear. I don't. I don't want to miss the the part about the athletics, but I'd love to understand kind of how you're managing the quarantine process uh, specifically. Mark, that sounds like a parental question, I have to say. I agree. I have, well, I have a 17-year-old daughter, and uh, we have hard enough time quarantining her in our house. I can't even imagine uh, quarantining her into a 13 by 13 dorm room for 14 days. So, But it's an important part of the process, right, to to offer safety to students on campus. And I know both of you have students that will be yeah. living on campus. So I'm just kind of curious about, about what process steps you guys are taking to, to overcome that. So we're uh, based on public health guidance from the state and uh, from other best practices. Um, we've adopted, we have about 4,000 beds on campus, 4,200 beds on campus. And about half of them are controlled directly by us and three dormitories that we own. and we have two additional dormitories that are managed by Campus Living Villages, a, a, a private sector outfit that has a long-term ground lease that operates those two dorms uh, under their own business model, uh, but to the benefit of our students. And uh, we've adopted a family living model, which really means that we have typically suites that have four bedrooms that are usually doubles in each bedroom and, a, and one or two shared bathrooms in, in each suite. And we are dropping down to a single person occupancy in a bedroom. So we're, for, for the 4,200 beds that we have on campus, we're actually gonna only have about 2,000 beds occupied. Um, the, the, the social distancing and the, the, the masking that's normally required in public, all public spaces is, is reduced within that living environment. But um, uh, we are asking each of the, the, the the students that are living within their their suites to to be mindful of this and to to be very careful about how they um, are out and about around campus. We are limiting the size of groups uh, publicly on campus. We are obviously requiring uh, uh, masking in public and 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 we are disinfecting uh, everywhere on campus. Um, but we are going to be. Uh, segregating a whole one of one wing or two wings of one of our dormitories um, to be used for quarantine in the event that any of our students who are in our housing become symptomatic. And uh, again, with the app that we're using and the, and the push that we have around public health, we are really asking our students to take care and, and uh, um, uh, work very closely with our RAs. We're having our RAs go through training about this so that they're prepared to, to work with the students living in campus housing. So we are attempting to become parental in this situation, and we know it, it will probably be challenging, but these are all students that have elected to want to live on campus, and uh, they and their families have, have decided that this is the modality they want to have. And um, again, it's going to be uh, highly dependent on the, the testing and quarantining that we will have available for those students in housing and then and acting quickly. Um, we have set up a whole team of folks that are running around doing uh, uh, contact tracing as necessary so that we can work quickly to, to move students that need to be quarantined into the quarantine section of one of our dormitories. Uh, so our case is very similar to what Taylor just described. Uh, obviously, we're smaller. Uh, we, our dorm is about, our residence hall is about three years old. Uh, the rooms were big enough. Uh, we used to have triples. Now we just have doubles. There's adequate um, spacing for the six foot separation. So we're still going to maintain two people in a room. They have a shared vanity area and then two separate um, bathrooms themselves. Uh, we have separated out rooms for isolation in, in a wing, and we have protocols in place for those students to stay in those isolations uh, with um, the RA or CA checking on them. And uh, we'll provide the food services that they need and, and make sure that they've got all their instructional materials, et cetera. So, and Mark, I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, the devil is in the details and whether the students will stay in what, what um, rewards or, or, or 
punishment there will be if they don't violate, if they violate are things that we're still working through and also trying to get student input from the, from the residence hall association as to how some of this would work uh, as we move through. And then through our testing, uh, through the test kits that we do have, those are the highest priority of students who will get the test are those who are in the residence halls who may become either infected or exposed to someone who has been infected, that they will have the benefit of having the testing right on campus. Yeah, I, I applaud both of you for um, for trying to make and and uphold the college experience. I think it's a it's a an important part of the learning process. Um, so that's I was just curious about about that. Thanks for your thanks for yeah. your feedback. I, I bet you Cynthia and I both wonder about how this is going to go down. But um, but if you look at some of our sister institutions outside of the state of Texas that have decided to bring. Mm -hmm. 30, 40, 50,000 students back to campus. I, I don't know how that's going to go. Speaking of uh, back to campus and maybe challenging decisions ahead, um, Dr. Amy, do you want to weigh in on football season, basketball season, the idea of having high contact sports uh, at this time? Yeah. As you can imagine, this is um, uh, an unsettled uh, situation and it remains unsettled. You might have noticed uh, yesterday that the NCAA Board of Governors uh, elected to ask each division to manage their own affairs, which kicked the ball down, sorry, bad pun, down the field a little bit. Uh, so division two and three, I, I can't even remember what they've decided. Since we're division one and, and football bowl subdivision and a member of Conference USA, we are still waiting for guidance from NCAA Division I. Um, you may all uh, be aware of the fact that all of the Power Five conferences have elected for football at least to um, uh, hold, tentatively plan to hold a season that might start a little bit later that's going to typically involve just in-conference play and maybe one out-of-conference game and maybe or maybe not a, a, a championship. Uh, there's still discussion about an FBS championship underway. Um, right now we have back on campus our football team, our, our women's soccer team, our women's volleyball team, and um, men's and women's basketball. We have a, a, a whole protocol in place that comes from NCAA, Conference USA, State of Texas guidance. Uh, and it adheres to our protocols that we've developed around how to try to bubble our student athletes. And uh, there's a high testing frequency that we're, we're using right now with our, our luckily our, our, our dear friends over at UT Health San Antonio. And our student athletes are probably the high, most highly tested population on campus. And uh, there's still protocols that are being developed and the conference hasn't even established yet final protocols for, for, for competitions. But this I know right now that uh, what is going to be required either for home competition or away competition will be testing three days before the actual um, event happens. And the, the, the team that you're competing against is going to be doing the same thing. And as you know about testing, you can get tested in 10 minutes and then go out to HEB and buy something and, and get infected. And the test is only as good as the time frame that you're in. And absent are being able to test everybody every day. Um, and, you know, the protocols that we're putting in place are as protective as, as they can be. Um, you're also aware of the fact that there are institutions that are deciding not to uh, compete. Um, uh, some of our sister institutions here in town have made that decision uh, at the FBS level. The University of Connecticut has just announced that they're not going to have fall sports and it will be interesting to see. I do know this, our student athletes to a person are very interested about competing and they want to be doing it in a very safe way and they're comfortable with how things are today and, and ask me next week and I may have a different answer for you. I have one more question for both of you. Um, kind of, uh, we've, obviously we've been focusing on the immediate, the, the fall semester and I guess to some degree that trickles into the spring semester, right? But I'm curious, I'd like to hear your long-term view of how the pandemic is changing higher education. Because I would think that as you lay down this digital groundwork, the reach of your universities um, will be much broader 
um, as we go forward. You know, Michael Crow talks about the new American university and, and does this accelerate uh, this transformation in higher education? So uh, I'll kick it off with Dr. Mattson. You know, where does your university go beyond the pandemic with, with all of these digital classes? Uh, and then, and then we'll, we'll close out with Dr. Amy. So, you know, one of the things that we've been talking about is looking around the corner and what do we see and not to be focused so much on what we're doing with the immediacy, but what do we need for the long term. And so clearly uh, online learning is, is an important component, but we also recognize that students want the connection. Students want to be on campus. Students value the academic experience, the learning experience, and the college experience. So finding the balance between those two is going to be vital for us as we move forward. Certainly, we will offer more online courses in the future, more than we would have done pre-pandemic. And we are, we're already in our academic plan moving towards advancing more online curriculum. One of the things that was in our longer term plan that we're moving forward quicker is the development of more public health programs. Uh, some of this we're doing in collaboration with a and College Station, which we're able to move faster in that regard in the both undergraduate and the graduate level. One of our fastest growing programs has been in the pre-med area. And we know we have many individuals who want to partner with us because of our high historically underrepresented minority community who are doing very well in the sciences and the math programs to be able to be prepared for pre-med. So these are some areas that we're looking at earlier and making more investments in those programs. We're also re-examining our teacher education and what does this digital divide and what's happening in K through 12 teach us about how we need to be preparing teachers in this new environment. We've been doing this all along, but now that everyone's attention you know, ubiquitously is heightened to teacher education, counselor education, and some of these other elements, we know how important that is going to be to our future. So we're re-examining everything that we're doing, but we're not veering off course from our academic plan in large trajectories. We're making small adjustments in areas where we know we can be competitive and successful as we continue our growth, not only in new academic programs, but facilities and support services and other elements that we're still adding into our programs like honors colleges, honors programs, and those types of things that will really be beneficial in South Bear County. So we have our lens on the future while we're mitigating through this short-term and medium-term pathway. You know, Josh, that's the, the most uh, important question that's being asked right now in higher education because this is a massive disruption, the pandemic and the economic downturn, especially to public higher education, although private institutions are really struggling now. And you can approach this disruption uh, two ways. You can be very uh, reactive and, and, and keep trying to, to make progress, or you can think about it as an opportunity to reinvent further and be ready to come out the other side of this whenever that is and whatever that looks like. I call it the new normal. You can be ready for that. Um, and I think some of the things that are gonna be highly, highly, um, thought of and, and, and pondered and, and sort of considered for public higher education involve how does an institution ensure lifelong learning, never mind for four years or six years or eight years. The lifelong learning concept is going to come back. I mean, people are going to want to think about career changes in five or 10 years. And why not come back to your, to your beloved AM San Antonio or UTSA and continue your educational trajectory beyond the normal time frame. I think there's this whole idea of flexibility and offering, which is now so prevalent this spring, this summer, and now this fall and next spring, and probably next summer, hopefully not, not beyond, but we'll see. This idea of flexibility is going to mean that we're not going to be measuring someone's degree progression by whether they've graduated in four years or not. We're going to measure it because they've done an internship, an externship. They've been paid to work at, at, at USAA. They've been paid through the, the May Center to do something really important and experiential. And, and it's the, the body of work that, that someone develops around learning in the real world that's going to be more important. All of our investments in, in capital projects on campuses are going to have to be rethought because all of a sudden, if you're having such a flexible um, modality, 
the space that you need for classrooms is not going to be the same as it was in the old days. And so what do you do with that space? Is there a way to rethink how you do experiential learning or, or, or focus on, 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 on cohort learning? And instead of having all, all classes, freshmen, sophomore, junior, seniors in your, in your housing, you might, might really want to hit a home run around retention, first year retention, and just have freshmen on campus. So there are all sorts of things that are going to be thought about, about how we, how we, how we uh, collaborate globally around research in the new normal because we've been doing it now for three or four months and it'll continue. How do we offer flexibility? How do we do experiential? How do we do lifelong? How do we manage space and the campus experience? How do you, you know, how do you do it? It's a Jaguar, right? Cynthia, did I remember yes. that correctly? How right. do you do a Jaguar or a Roadrunner experience that's meaningful that, that as, as um, Mark was indicating about actually the meaningfulness of being on campus, how do you continue that when things are so flexible? So, so I think those institutions that have pondered this are ready to come out of the new normal, ready to go. And what we've done is our tactical teams that we've uh, developed to be prepared for this fall about academic delivery and campus, campus experience, we are continuing with four or six additional tactical teams that are starting to look at coming out of the new normal. And we will begin a strategic planning process sometime later next year that takes the work of these tactical teams and goes forward and, and actually helps uh, sort of uh, further uh, sort of crystallize our approach as to what UTSA is gonna be doing to be ready for the new normal. And so it's gonna take a lot of planning and effort and it's gonna segue from our tactical team approach uh, over the next uh, nine months and do something meaningful about how we're gonna position ourselves for the future. But it, the way we've done business is not the way we will do business and the way we educate uh, up until <laughs> this year is gonna, uh, is gonna change dramatically and what we do going forward will be meaningful, very meaningful. And, I have to say, if you're a faculty member that's grown up in the model of teaching in front of a classroom and uh, and how you pivot to to online modalities, and I think technology is going to be critical in, in how we do uh, sort of virtual reality uh, as a teaching model, how we do uh, augmented reality as a teaching model, how we do um, experiential learning and cohort learning in a in a in a in a uh, online modality. All of these things are going to be changing dramatically and and be highly disruptive. So I know that that Cynthia needs to do this, we need to do this, and we just have to be focused on this to be ready to come out of this, to be ahead of the curve, so to speak. You know, Josh, I think one of the things that is also <laughs> happening nationally is that there will be places that won't make it. There will be colleges and universities that won't be around. And so I think some are real in significant financial distress. You're going to see more institutional mergers. Uh, you're going to see um, educational partnerships looking very differently than what you're seeing now in the higher ed landscape. Maybe not so much in Texas, but in other parts of the United States. And it will have a trickle down effect in Texas. Uh, Texas has a high degree, a high number of students who stay in Texas for college education. It'll be interesting to see what happens this fall term. Typically about 5% of Texans leave the state to go to another institution. And that number may be slightly higher in San Antonio uh, because a lot of private schools are targeting historically underrepresented minorities and uh, the cherry picking that goes on in some of our best students. So I think it'll be really curious for us now to see what's going to happen uh, for those students that will stay closer to home uh, versus the other. So we are all, I, I think, repositioning to some extent to what Taylor said and to other extent, you know, di different people are looking at different variables as, as Taylor responded and how we think about our strategic plan. And as I said, for A&M San Antonio, I don't see us uh, veering off course on our strategic plan and our academic plan. How we do things may be slightly different, but we've been laying these things out. We're a little different than Taylor and that we're an emerging and growing university. So we don't have that um, stability or maturity that comes with a 150 year old organization or even a hundred year old organization. Wait, we're only 50 years old. Yeah, we're, we're 10. <laughs> and all of our faculty are young. Uh, in many cases, it's their, their first job. So they come in very, you know, poised for uh, mobile, mobile teaching, mobile learning, alternative technologies, uh, all the other things that are 
we are really fortunate to have. Um, but, but you're right, Taylor, even, even at a 50 year old institution, even at a 10 year old institution, you have cultures and microcultures that begin to emerge. And as you get bigger, those microcultures get more widespread. So it really becomes challenging to keep everybody moving in the same strategic direction. Um, and that is something that I think we've been pretty nimble at at AM San Antonio. But I think the, the landscape around us is going to be markedly different in higher ed. And, and nobody knows what that future is going to look like. Well, I want to thank both of you for taking the time to speak with us about higher ed. I mean, we could go on and on. It's it's a fascinating topic. And um, to the viewers out there who stuck with us for this hour, thank you for reading. Thank you for watching and caring. Um, and uh, we will all stay in touch. So thanks to all of you. And we'll ask more questions on, an, on another day. <laughs>